um, needing a slide, which it's probably up for me to do. I am 26 years old, more, almost half my life ago. And I am tired. It's the end of a day. It's the end of a long month working with women and women's groups in the Nairobi's Mathari Valley slum. And I'm at the bottom of the valley in my old Volkswagen car, and all I want to do is get home. And suddenly I see this purple bruise start spreading across the sky. And before you know it, the heavens open and it slams sheets of water and I can feel my car sinking in the sludge. And I think, damn. And close my eyes and lean back. And suddenly in the midst of this rain, I hear this tap, tap, tap on my window. And I look over and there's this tiny woman with a little walnut face and raisin eyes peering at me. And she says, Kuja, come. And I say, I'm not getting out of this car. <laughs> and she says, with authority this time, in a gravelly voice, Kuja. And for whatever reason, I get out of the car, and I follow her through one of these narrow paths, past these little matchbox houses made of scrap, metal, and cardboard, and plastic, piled on top of one another, impossibly. And we get to this metal door, and she asks me to walk in, and I do, and inside the room, there are these women dancing, and there's this man sitting on the floor, and he's drumming, and the rain is hitting the corrugated tin roofs, and there's all this rhythm, and the women are dancing in pairs, and they're leaning over, and their cheeks are against one another, and I don't really know what to do. I'm feeling a little awkward, and so... I just jump in, and I put my cheek against the sweaty face of a woman, and I start shaking with them and ululating, and there's this flash of color and power and hips and teeth, and I am lost. <laughs> I am lost in the power and the beauty and the rhythm and the staccato pounding of the rain, and I am part of them, and they are part of me, and then it stops. And I stand there looking around, seriously not knowing what to do, and I thank them all for this experience and say goodbye, and I kind of feel like I'm walking out of a New York City bar in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> and I get back into my car, and a bunch of boys push, pushes, and I start going back up into town. And as I'm driving back, I start thinking about what just happened. I know the lives of these women. I work with them. I know about their lack of electricity and their lack of clean water. I have been to the funerals of their babies. The week before, I walked to a meeting past the, dead, the, the body of a dead man who'd been necklaced the nice, b night before with a burning tire around his neck. And despite all that violence, all that poverty, when they were dancing, they were beautiful. They were strong and proud, they were alive, they were feminine, they were resilient. And they had this sense of belonging and connection to one another. And I started thinking about why that came from tribe and tradition and from the daily sharing of tribulations, tragedies, and triumphs. And I thought, I'm 26 years old and already I've worked in 40 countries. I've lived in three countries on the African continent. Where do I belong? What is my home? And I didn't have any answers, so I dove deeper into the questions. In Rwanda, I worked with a small group of women, and we started the country's first microfinance bank. And there I saw how identity and belonging could create a sense of strength and, stre uh, uh, and enhance individual dignity. And I also saw how it could divide and destroy, because the women with whom I had started that bank played out every role in the genocide, from being victims to bystanders to major perpetrators. And so I continued to ask the questions. And for years, decades, I worked on all of these issues. And finally, almost 20 years later, I found my role in life, my purpose, which was to try to help the world change the way fundamentally it tackles poverty move away from these simplistic ideas of it's all about the markets, it's all about charity or aid, but recognize that as human beings, we're more complex than that. 
and that we need to start with understanding low-income people for who they are and build solutions from their perspectives, knowing that dignity is more important to the spirit than wealth. And I started an organization called Acumen, and at the center of it is this idea of patient capital, that we could take philanthropy, which is our most risk-oriented capital, or should be, and invest it in those entrepreneurs who dare to go where markets and government have failed the poor, to experiment, to fail, to try again, and to build those kinds of solutions that enable people to make their own choices, their own decisions. And 12 years later, I've seen that it works. I've seen millions of people get access, hundreds of, tens of thousands of people get jobs. But I've also found something that was more surprising to me, and that's a community of journeyers with me, starting with the entrepreneurs. Individuals around the world who share my values and understand that the status quo is no longer an option, and that business as usual cannot exist any longer. We need to think about investing not only as an end, but as a means, particularly when it comes to low-income populations and what it will take to build a truly inclusive economy. People who are willing to dare and fail and talk about their failures. And that that has been one of the great joys in bringing me home my, and helping me start and find my community. My work at Acumen has enabled me to meet incredible entrepreneurs. Each of them come with their own sense of home and identity, and they're different. People like Tok Sabimbola and Iggy Basi, both from different places. Toks was born in Nigeria. Dad was a businessman and a politician, mom a trader. They moved to London when he was 10 years old and had a really privileged life. Best public schools, university, worked in energy and technology, and didn't go back to Africa just because he was African, but because he saw a real opportunity and challenge and he wanted to stretch and push himself. Iggy, on the other hand, was born into a working class family in England. Parents are immigrants from India, factory workers who sacrificed almost everything so that the kids could have a great education and Iggy didn't let them down. Graduated from Cambridge. And he said that his identity and sense of home connects him to the poor in different ways because he's, it fuels an anger in him at, at inequality. And when it comes to identity, he said, his is kind of complex because he's an Indian Sikh working class Brit who's married to, <laughs> with a Cambridge degree, who's married to a Brazilian Catholic working with a Nigerian in Ghana. <laughs> um, so like me, he rejects simplicity. What's amazing about these two guys, though, is that different reasons drove them to Ghana to start a rice farm, because they want to prove, ultimately, that Africa can, can build its own food system. And Ghana imports 70% of its rice, despite the fact that it's its main staple. You can get rice from Asia, and you can even get Uncle's Benz, but you can't get Ghanaian-branded rice. And so they decided they were going to start this farm, but they weren't going to do business as usual. They were going to do things the right way, not the easy way. First thing, innovation they made was not get caught up in the land grab, but lease a large tract of land from a trusted clan chief and bring in Brazilian techniques and technologies to grow that rice. Second, they agreed to a revenue share with the clan, and they have checks and balances to make that happen. And third, around the nuclear farm, nucleus farm, they've agreed over the next five years to train 7,000 smallholder farmers so that they can double their yields and income. And it hasn't been easy. They have faced corruption with a vendor and bureaucracy and complacency, and Tokes has to spend most of his time living on the farm. But today, GADCO is the largest rice producer in Ghana. It's very cool. They've got COPA branded rice on the shelves. We've invested our patient capital and know it's going to change that, the way we think about this. And the community has used its revenues to build infrastructure, dams and schools and electricity and education. And Ghana has a new model for development. And now people want to take it to other countries as well. 
My work at Acumen allows me to work with incredible individuals like Godfrey Mwindade. Now, Godfrey was born into a very poor family in northern Ghana. He tells these stories about uh, reading by the light of the moon and falling asleep as night as his auntie would stir a, a, a pot of water, uh, hoping the kids would fall asleep before they realized that there was no dinner coming because she had no food. And still Godfrey found a way to be seen by the priests, get great education, and he earned himself a scholarship to Hull University. Went on to become a banker here in London and in Africa. Stan Bick named him the best retail banker in Africa. But it wasn't enough. So he decided to go to the African Development Bank and he ran a $4 billion private equity fund. And still he didn't think it was getting to the poor, not his poor. So he joined Acumen a year ago and he runs our operations in West Africa looking for those entrepreneurs who are willing to go into those areas and build businesses that serve people who are like his family. And while he's in Ghana and he's home, I know Godfrey and I know there are days when he feels like he's anything but because he has to deal with daily frustrations. And yet, when I ask him, he says, you know, I'm where I need to be because when I was working in the city for Barclays, I would hear my bosses talking about the talent drain in Africa and the gap there. And I resolved that one day I would go back and I would help fix it. And so I'm at a place where I have home from here and the home I've brought. And it's where I'm best used. Now, Bruce Robertson has a different story. He's a third generation South African and he's never really left the continent. He told me that he doesn't feel whole anywhere else. And I thought I would just read his words because they're more beautiful than anything I could say. He writes, I need to be able to love. It does not mean that I always like it or don't get eye scratchingly frustrated with some of the goings on, but it means that I feel of the place. The trees are my trees, an archetype deep in my memory. The bird calls evoke childhood memories, hierarchy, heartaches. There is a quality in the relationship with the people I work with, which goes beyond what is implied by the description of coworker or stakeholder. It is an entanglement of prejudices, forgiveness, aspirations, and love. It is an enriching milieu in which contractual formalities are unnecessary but not condition, sufficient condition for fulfillment. A few years ago, Bruce came to Acumen and he asked if we would invest patient capital in his cotton ginning business. business. He wanted to take it up to Gulu. Someone talked about Joseph Kony before, this part of Uganda that was decimated by 20 years of civil war. Over a million people spent those 20 years living in IDP camps and we're now coming back into the area with few skills, no money, very little trust. But Bruce had been a cotton ginner in South Africa and, um, and Uganda for decades. And so it was an easy decision for us to invest that capital. And again, it has been a long and hard and eye-scratchingly difficult journey at times. He used grant money and patient capital to train farmers and give them implements. And he's had to deal not only with the things that Iggy's and Tokes did, but also huge price volatility. And to give you a sense, about 15 years ago, there were 15 Ugandan cotton ginners in the country. Today, there are three. It is a hard road. But Bruce is going to make it, and this is why patient capital can help. But 30,000 farmers now grow their cotton and sell to his company, and 10,000 sesame farmers as well. What's exciting to me is I get to work with and invest in, through Acumen, in, in entrepreneurs across the continent that are, have the, the humility to recognize the world as it is and understand how tough this can be, but the audacity to envision and dream a different world and try to make it happen. We've invested in a guy named John Wambachi in Kenya who is using a mobile tech application to reduce inefficiencies and corruptions in the agricultural supply chain and already 350,000 tea farmers in Kenya are seeing a 10 to 11 percent or 10 to 12 percent increase in their income. Ashivi Gogo created another company based on a mobile app where you text in a number that you scratch off of medicine or pharmaceuticals and you're told immediately whether that medicine is counterfeit. Um, yeah. 
you might think it's a surprise or not, but he started in Nigeria and then he moved. <laughs> And then we have been able to help him because everyone needs it. He's in Kenya now, India. We just helped get him register in Pakistan and Ghana. Three million scratch-offs have already been done. And Craig DeRoy is a CEO from a Fortune 500 company who works, uh, works in land titling. And he came to Ghana to start the country's first for-profit land titling company. And he has a long road ahead of him, but I was just there yesterday, and to see what people are doing now that they're understanding that they can register their own plot and are willing to pay for it. Um, when Craig talks about the company, he says, not only do I see what we can do here and across the continent because of the big issue of land, but I personally have changed fundamentally because I understand that especially when the women get title, it's not just a legal document. This is about legacy. This is about ownership. This is about dignity and connection. I was recently in Gulu, where the cotton gin is, and I got to talk to one of the farmers named Basel, and he's exactly my age. And he was telling me about the 20 years spent in an IDP camp where he felt useless and hopeless. And I said, you know, I was talking to him and I was looking at him and I was thinking, no, you are brave and you are resolute because the idea of coming back and slowly, slowly finding yourself home and meaning is something few of us have the true courage to do. And later that afternoon, I was standing in front of one of the old cotton gins that had been placed there in 1963 when the factory was first open. And it struck me that 1963 was the year that Dr. Martin Luther King led the marches through Birmingham, Alabama, and for doing that was put in jail. And it was in that jail that he wrote his elegiac, exquisite letter from a Birmingham jail cell. And some of my favorite lines are when he writes that we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Basel is connected to Bruce and to me and to everyone who wears clothing made by cotton grown in Gulu. And Dr. King understood that. He understood that we are each other's destiny. And so it is to us the most global connected, skilled, aware, and privileged generation that perhaps the world has ever seen to stand on the shoulders of giants like King and Mandela and Albi Sachs, who started and taught us how fundamental it is to extend that fundamental assumption that all men are created equal to every man, woman, and child on this planet. It starts with a, a vision of a single world in which each of us must navigate our own identities in the context of our societies inside and without, in which each of us must recognize that what we all want is to be seen, to be visible, to be somebody's and not nobody's. When I was recently in Mathari Valley again, where I danced with those women, a young boy came up to me and said, Miss Novogratz, I want to help bridge the gap between rich and poor too. And so he should. When it comes to home, we each have a different story. But when it comes to meaning, perhaps we all share a single story. For it is a story of our deep, deepest human yearning for connection and belonging and love. But when we talk about meaning, we too often make the mistake of thinking that meaning is bestowed upon us when in fact, we must create meaning. And we create it through the relationships we forge and the institutions we help build and the ideas for which we stand and for which sometimes we fight. And the bigger the idea and the bigger the challenge and the problem we confront, the more meaning we can create. But that doesn't come without a price. Sometimes that price is eye-scratchingly, bone-cracking, frustratingly hard. But it is also the best and maybe the only way 
to take that real road to changing the lives of others and in so doing, finally, ultimately, coming home to our truest self. As long as we don't forget to dance along the way. Thank you. <laughs>